Anil, to get a sense of where we are today in uh, consciousness studies, uh, it's good to know the historical development, certainly in recent times, about how we got to where we are. So from your perspective, uh, what's a good time to start? I mean, people have always been talking about the mind-body problem in some sense or another. But in terms of the modern uh, consciousness studies community, but what do you look towards as the initial period of time and what have been some of the major developments in, until now? I do think it's important to reach back a little bit because it really was Rene Descartes hundreds of years ago <laughs> that, that gave us the problem of consciousness mm. in the form mm. that people have been wrestling with it ever since, mm. which is this dualism, this dualistic perspective between conscious experiences and the brain, the body, the, the material world. And then there were lots of sort of ups and downs over the hundreds of years. And a lot of people talk about consciousness research being born or reborn in the 1990s. Now, it was there at the very beginning of psychology and neuroscience. Mm -hmm. People like William James talked about it a lot towards the end of the, the 19th century. Um, but because of perceived problems with how you can study consciousness, the reliability of introspection, then consciousness research kind of went to the fringes and then completely beyond the yeah. pale out into the wilderness for many decades. Yeah, I did my doctorate in neuroscience uh, and neurophysiology in 1964 to 1968, and my motivation was to think about how can I understand consciousness. That was really my motivation. And I don't remember once in four years using the term in terms of working with my professors or anything else. That's interesting. I mean, even when I was, I did my undergraduate degree 1991 to 1994, and that was in psychology, ended up in psychology in, in Cambridge. And I was taught by some of the leading behaviorist psychologists who were very against consciousness <laughs> being within the remit of psychology. So even in the early 1990s, okay. from the perspective as a student, it was still not really a legitimate topic of study. But by then, unbeknownst to me at the time, <laughs> it was becoming uh, rehabilitated in, in other places. Mm. And this rehabilitation, I think, happened for a couple of reasons. On the one hand, there were some serious philosophers who started talking about consciousness, not only from a philosophical perspective, but also bringing in some experiments, evidence from psychology and neuroscience. So people like Daniel Dennett, who, who we sadly lost earlier this year, uh, that changed the game. Then you had work in science that was also beginning to say sensible things about consciousness. Bernard Bars, a psychologist, formulated the first version of what became or still is the global workspace theory in the late 1980s. And then in the early 1990s, we had the beginnings of the Neural Correlates of Consciousness research program inaugurated, or at least officially inaugurated, mm -hmm. by Francis Crick and, and Christoph Koch. And the idea there was, like, okay, look, there are these intractable philosophical problems about how consciousness relates to the physical world, if indeed it does. But we know, as a matter of empirical fact, that the brain is intimately related to consciousness. So let's just focus on these empirical correlations, the neural correlates of consciousness, and let's look at something that is relatively well understood from other branches of neuroscience, the visual system. So let's focus on visual awareness and look for the, the neural correlates of visual perception. And that was also game-changing because at the same time, uh, brain imaging methods are becoming more widely available. Mm -hmm. So suddenly you can do experiments. You can have people in brain scanners where their subjective experience might change. And binocular rivalry, for instance, the stimulus is the same, but conscious experience flips mm. from one thing to the other. So you can begin to ask questions like, well, what happens in the brain when perception changes, but the stimulus doesn't? I think all of these things contributed to this sort of first wave of, of excitement in the 1990s. And you had the formation of new journals, the Journal of Consciousness Studies, Consciousness and Cognition, series of conferences that are still going on now. And so from the 1990s on, that's really the path that we've been following. What's been interesting to see is the progressive integration of philosophy with neuroscience yeah. and psychology. I think when I started, again, back in the early 1990s, still being interested in, even though my behaviorist supervisors mm -hmm. were not so much, um, there were still largely distinct communities. And that's been changing 
over the last two, three decades, mm. for sure. And I think that's been an essential part of it. There's also been this growth in theoretical work and the availability of you know, new methods, the, the, the power of computers to sustain large detailed models of neural systems has also helped. So now I think there is this, at least in some areas, a very productive interaction um, between theory and experiment. And some theories have really become among the more prominent. So there's probably a group of four, global workspace theory, integrated information theories, higher order theories, and broadly predictive processing theories, mm -hmm. of which you know, I'm, my ideas are part of that, that family. And those are not necessarily totally mutually exclusive. You could have some nest things from one to the other, I would assume. Yeah, you can. And there's been work trying to figure out you know, what are the, where are the overlaps. Mm. Uh, that can be a useful thing to do because you can, you, know, you can leverage different ways of thinking. If you can make connections between theories, you, you can, um, well, you, you're better placed to understanding where they differ and where they say the same thing. Yeah. They're also not mutually exclusive in a more problematic way, which is that they are often theories of different things. Mm. They all purport to be theories <laughs> of consciousness, but then when That's you, you yeah. drill down into yeah. you know, what are they actually theories yeah. of, if they're theories of different things, well, then, of course, they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah. I, I, I'm uh, known to take the opposite view, and that says that there's a danger in narrowing down too quickly because we, we have uncertainty to narrow down to four or 22 or whatever, that, um, th that gives the impression that, that those are the, that's the only game in town. And uh, some of that is because those communities have similar kinds of, shall we say, fundamental assumptions, physicalism or whatever it is. And there's, a really a very broad range of theories or ways of thinking about consciousness, and I'd be concerned that we don't uh, squeeze those off too soon in order to really understand what consciousness is. Yeah, I think I broadly agree with that. I mean, I think all the current theories that we have are wrong, but hopefully they're not entirely wrong, or hopefully at least some of them are not entirely yeah. wrong. And I think the key is the, diff the difference between necessity and sufficiency that some of the theories that are known in physicalists may be necessary, but may not be sufficient. Right. This brings us to what would be the criterion for a successful theory. You know, we, we want, on the one hand, to provide explanatory insight, yep. predictive power, so we can tell what, what is conscious, what isn't, um, <laughs> you know, what kind of consciousness might, might be happening. And we also want it to provide both necessary and sufficient conditions. And I don't think many theories are like that. There is one integrated information theory does propose right. sufficient conditions. But many of the other theories that we have, like global workspace theory, higher order theory, to me they seem more descriptive of how consciousness unfolds in human beings and perhaps other animals. They're not laying down, okay, if you have these conditions, then you have a, a conscious system. So yeah, that's, what, that's where we need to go. There's also, I think, this distinction between um, scientific theories and philosophical theories. Yep. So this speaks to this assumptions that may be common to all. So most of the prominent theories are in some way or another physicalist, materialist theories. Many are computational theories yeah, too, and true. I think for me that's, that's a more problematic <laughs> assumption. And why, why should that be the case? Uh, and of course we have a, other philosophical theories too, besides materialism panpsychism, <laughs> monism, idealism. And these may turn out to be ultimately more useful frameworks. But they are different philosophical frameworks in this sense, as far as I can see, behave according to different rules and should be evaluated by different criteria. You don't test physicalism. Mm -hmm. you, you ask whether it's useful in the game of explaining the phenomena in question. You can't refute it in an experiment.